Level design is a key part of game development, as it involves the creation of video game worlds, levels, missions and stages. This can require many tools to create, from level editors, game engines and techniques. All of this and more is what is used to build levels that you love to play in games. Hi, my name is Michael Kirby and welcome to the bonus episode of my mini-series, Level Design Untold Tricks. In these videos, we have broken down and explored how level design can use hidden tricks and techniques that can be used to affect players' experiences. Whether this be through different types of boundaries to give players information or conceal it from them, or using knowledge of architecture to influence how players tackle or navigate the game's world, as well as using elements of signposting like lighting, collectibles, and colour coding to guide them and direct them without hand holding. All of these tricks just mentioned have been covered in great detail in my previous episodes boundaries, techniques of architecture, and signposting. For this episode, we will be looking at teaching mechanics. For the purpose of this video, we are exploring how teaching mechanics through level design works and how it can reinforce the tricks we have mentioned in the last three episodes. Teaching mechanics in level design can be a very strong trick to get right if done well. The common way to achieve this is by having tutorial levels made to teach these mechanics. This can be dedicated tutorial arenas or tutorials that are blended into the gameplay and the story of the main game. In a GDC talk, it was revealed that Bethesda has a technique that they call the Bethesda loop. Bethesda's loop is broken up into four sections and they are learn, play, challenge, and lastly, surprise. Bethesda uses this loop to teach players new mechanics, with learn being the starting point, whether this be through tooltip UI or NPC dialogue. Then they let players play around with the new mechanic, allowing them to get used to what they've been taught without any game over consequences. This then nicely leads to a challenge stage. Here is where players are tested to see how well they know the new mechanic, with there now being more consequences. The last stage is surprise. This is where the game will surprise players to break the repetition of the mechanic. While Bethesda has their own way of doing things, it's not the only way. Each studio will have their own way of teaching players new mechanics of the game. But this can be a good guide to keep in mind and we can see other games using similar methods in their own work. One of the best game studios to analyse and study is Nintendo. Nintendo have been using level design to teach players since World 1-1, all the way back in 1985. You are probably already well aware of the genius behind the opening part of World 1-1, but let's break it down anyway. When you start off with Mario, you are able to move right or left. Initially you're going to instinctively move forward, as there is a plane of open space compared to behind Mario where you can see the edge of the screen. Side note, if you did decide to go left, you wouldn't be able to go far as the path behind Mary is blocked off by a boundary. So as you do move forward, you will come across a block in mid-air, and your first enemy encounter. Back in 1985, your controller only had four buttons and the D-pad. You knew already by moving Mario that the D-pad moves him, and that the select and start buttons were for the menu screen. So as a player, your instinct is to press the other two buttons, B and A. When you pressed A, Mario would jump. With this newfound ability, you will attempt to jump over the enemy. But because of the single mid-air block, Mario won't be able to make it over the enemy, but instead will land on the enemy, which will defeat it. In addition, during that you would be able to learn that blocks with question marks give you coins, and then later on, power-ups. Which leads us to the final part of this Super Mario Bros breakdown, the mushroom power-up. When you release the mushroom, it will move forward from the platform, fall down, bump into the pipe and turn and head towards Mario. In this situation, you only have three options. Stay still and see what happens, run backwards and learn that you can't go back, or three, try and jump over the mushroom, but you will discover that because of the blocks above you, you won't be able to jump that high. In the end, the mushroom will hit you, and you will get a visual cue that Mario is bigger, and you will learn that he can jump high because of this. To sum it up, we have learnt how to move Mario, how to jump, 
how to defeat an enemy, what question mark blocks do, what different collectibles there are, i.e. coins and power-ups, and there's no going backwards. In addition to what you could have also learnt, what happens if you press B instead of A, and what happens if you get hit by the enemy, which will be game over and death. All of this was learnt in the first 5 to 10 seconds of the game, all through the game's level design. Now if we compare this to a more recent Nintendo game, like Zelda Breath of the Wild, we can see how far games have come and how level design can still play a big part in teaching mechanics to players. Of course nowadays, games have more complex mechanics and systems in them, along with advanced consoles and controllers compared to the days of 1985. Controllers now have more buttons, triggers and analog sticks to control and manoeuvre your avatar around the game's world. Because of this, sometimes teaching players mechanics is a bit more tricky, and you will need to use other solutions to inform players, with UI, NPC dialogue, cutscenes and breadcrumbs, just to name a few. Zelda Breath of the Wild is a big game where you can customise, cook, fight and explore Hyrule. So with such a massive and expansive game like this, how does it teach players new mechanics compared to Super Mario Bros in 1985? How far have games come? A perfect place to start is the opening of the game. Already things start off differently with a cutscene which is not only used to introduce us to Link but also points us in the right direction to get the Sheikah slate by having the camera focus on it for a few seconds to highlight its importance. Then we are greeted by several UI pop-ups to tell us how to move and interact with objects. When we interact with the pedestal that gives us the Sheikah slate, we then have some dialogue telling us what the slate does. Once that's done we get a short cutscene and then more UI. This then opens up the path ahead for us to go into another room full of boxes and chests which the player can interact with as we now know which button to press. Of course it still helps that we get the odd UI pop-up now and again. Then after we've opened up some chests, we get more dialogue and cutscenes to tell us more about the slate and the pedestals, which is handy to know and identify with, especially when we get to the shrines later on. With the path ahead fully open, we can learn to sprint and climb with the help of pop-up UI, and boom, we are introduced to the vast world ahead. So comparing these two opening parts of the games, we can see there's a lot of differences. This doesn't mean that one was better than the other, but it's interesting to see how each one teaches players new mechanics through the level design. Granted, Super Mario Bros level design took a more pivotal role, while Breath of the Wild had a more of a supporting role. The shrines in Breath of the Wild are a great example to teach players the game's new mechanics that can be used to help players traverse the game's world more. If you've played Breath of the Wild, you know the first four shrines give you abilities you will need to help you on your adventure. These four shrines start in the same way. That, inserting your Sheikah Slate into a pedestal to give you a new ability, and allowing you to play around with that ability in a controlled environment at the start. For example, the shrine that gives you Magnesis only has two metallic objects for you to move around, to progress forward. Once you move them, you enter another area that lets you play around and practice with moving boxes out of a wall to make it collapse or completely knock it down. Then the final area has an enemy that offers up some challenges. This area has two types of challenges, that using the metallic objects to get across gaps to open the doors ahead. The other one is using your ability to grab a chest from high up. This last one is showing you how far you can reach metallic objects. Once players have completed the shrine, they are rewarded and returned back to the world above, where they can play around and use the ability on enemies and parts of the environment. And even for more challenges, they can tackle other shrine dungeons all over the map. Here we can see a similar cycle to the one the professor uses in their loop, that being teach players a new mechanic, then let them play and practice without any consequences, and then challenge, testing players' knowledge of that mechanic. This is what the level design in the shrines offer players in Breath of the Wild. Then the surprise part of it more comes down to what players are able to do in the world above. Ultimately, we have learnt a lot about how level design can teach players mechanics through the game's world and gameplay, which at times can be supported by any of the untold tricks we have looked at, from boundaries, techniques of architecture and signposting. 
Overall, everything we've looked at should be taken on board as guides to benefit the game and players' journeys from start to finish. A big thank you for everyone supporting my content. It's been a full year since I started these videos, and what a better way to celebrate than going back to the mini-series where it all begun. If you enjoy these types of videos, then subscribe and hit the bell icon for more notifications about future projects. I have also put together a short questionnaire about the kind of content people might want to see moving forward. The link to that would be in the description down below. All that being said, thank you and have a great day and catch you in the next video.